Um, as we're reconvening, I'm going to start introducing our next speaker, who is uh, Lois Davis. She's a senior policy researcher from the RAND Corporation. I learned something today that RAND stands for R and D, which I kind of love. Um, so, um, and uh, she will be talking about RAND's evaluation of prosecutorial led resentencing programs in California. Dr. Davis, would you take it away? Great, thank you so much. Um, what I wanna do is to um, share with you um, um, a briefing that summarizes quickly the key points that I wanted to discuss today. And then, um, and then I'm happy to um, um, answer any questions you may have. So let me, um, um, let's see if, can you see that briefing? Okay, great. So um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, um, RAND's evaluating the three-year pilot program that's been implemented here in California, and we're still in the early stages of the evaluation. So, so part of my discussion today is really giving you more of insights of how the process is going. So as you well know, um, this is under 1172, and really the goal was to support a uh, collaborative approach to prosecutorial resentencing. Nine California counties received funding for this three-year pilot, and within each county, the following agencies received funding specifically to participate in the pilot program. In the legislation, it's very specific about what, as the evaluator, we are required to report to the legislature. But basically, it breaks down to there's three components to the evaluation a descriptive and outcomes analysis of data collected by the district attorney offices on cases, a qualitative implementation assessment, and a cost study. I wanted to give you an overview of what the review and resentencing process looks like. If you look at the far left side, starting with identification, that large arrow, there's a number of different entities that can identify individuals as potentially being eligible for resentencing under this pilot program, starting with the DA, the public defender, community-based organizations, the individuals themselves, their family, attorneys. In the upper left-hand corner, I have CDCR grayed out, and I'll talk more about that because it's important to understand that at the same time as we have this pilot going on, CDCR is also has resentencing going on, and that comes into play uh, later on. So for those that are um, in the black boxes, so cases that are identified um, then go to the DA for review to make sure that they meet the eligibility criteria for their county, and the DA will make certain decisions. They'll either want more information, so they'll have they'll uh, defer uh, decisions until they gather that information. They may decide that it's too early in the process and that they want the case to come back to them in a year or so <clears throat> and the individuals further along. Um, they may decide not to refer. For example, they may decide it doesn't meet their eligibility criteria or that, or that for example, there's um, real, real violations on their uh, record within the past few years that kind of disqualifies them for right now for resentencing. And then they'll make the decision which cases to refer to the courts. The courts will, um, of course, go through their process. But on the far right, you see that there's basically three outcomes. They either resentence and release, resentence but still incarcerated with reduced sentences, or denied. So this is what it looks like um, and when we think about what criteria our pilot county is using. Remember that the legislation gave the counties wide latitude to define what their criteria would be. But what we see across the nine counties is the most common inclusion criteria have to do with the inmate's age, the type of crime, the length of sentence, and the common exclusion criteria are basically crimes considered too egregious for resentencing, such as sex offender registrant or violent felonies as listed in these penal code sections. So here's what that looks like. In the first six months of the pilot, basically September 2021 to March 2022, the DAs um, reviewed 259 cases. The most common characteristics of those cases are that 70% of them were in individuals who were over the age of 50, 60% were crimes against person, not showing, uh, showing 20% were property crimes, and about 7% were drug-related crimes. About half were three strikers, um, half also had initial sentences over 30 years, and 75% had some type of sentence enhancement. The most common types of enhancements were a nickel enhancement in about a third of the cases or a firearms enhancement in about a quarter of the cases. So going back to the flow chart, this is what it looks like. 
first um, starting at the far left, you'll see that the DA was a predominant way by which ind individual cases were identified as being considered for resentencing. In that case, it was 203 of the 259 cases came from the DA himself, him or herself. Um, when we look at the, the, the DA decision-making process, most of those cases, two thirds, were still uh, put into the bucket of DA decision pending. What that meant is they either wanted more additional information, they were seeking, for example, they were reaching out to the victims to get their input on whether or not this individual should be considered for resentencing. They may find that the supporting documents was inadequate and they wanted more information um, to be able to make a decision whether or not to refer to the court or not. Um, 88 cases were not referred and these tended to be things like they at a close examination, they did not meet the county's eligibility criteria, or for example, they had a, um, other disqualifying um, information on the record that, that didn't made it, that the, 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 the DA decided that they could not refer it forward. In terms of those cases that we referred to the courts, only eight, um, again, within six months of the pilot beginning, and two of them were released, two were resentenced, but still incarcerated. So I want to just make some observations. We're early on in the, in the evaluation, but just something to think about. I know you've heard before from other counties and other contexts that obtaining data from CDCR is, is cumbersome. It takes time, and that's true here. Um, what the counties need these data for is to help them identify which individuals from their county might be eligible for resentencing. But in addition of, of taking time to get that data, the pilot counties vary a lot in their staff and analytic capabilities to analyze those data. That has contributed to delays as well. Counties were each given uh, the same pot of money. It was interesting that if you're LA County, you were given $350,000. If you were little Yolo or Humboldt County, you were given $350,000 to contract with community-based organizations. Most of the counties viewed the role of the CBOs as assisting with reentry planning and providing reentry supports. But the counties are struggling somewhat to put these CBO contracts into place. Small counties, not surprisingly, have limited options in terms of contracting with um, local resources. Um, in addition, what's interesting about this pilot is that it's really um, hinged on the idea that the DA and the PD will work collaborative very closely in implementing and designing their, their resentencing pilot programs. In those counties where they have a history of working together, they're further along in their pilot programs. But in general, what you see is a little bit of a tension between the public defenders wanting a much more expansive role in, in the resentencing process, including defining the eligibility criteria and identifying cases. And the DAs seem that the PD should have a much more limited role, which is really basically helping prepare individuals as they move towards the courts. Preparing the applications, I'm using the term applications loosely, but the, but the range of information that goes into um, an individual putting forth their request to be considered for resentencing um, is time consuming. In general, the courts want evidence of rehabilitation as well as strong reentry plans. But the counties vary a lot in terms of the degree of assistance they've decided to provide individuals in preparing this information and preparing their reentry plans. Further, individuals can vary widely in the level of assistance needed. So from an analytic standpoint, what it tells us is that it's going to be difficult to assign an average cost per case, but it's, as we, we are looking at the resources that really are required to move this along. In year two of the evaluation, we're going to be focusing on the court's decision-making processes, and, and we're going to be doing in-depth interviews with each of the courts in the nine pilot counties. But what we may see is really those individuals that were successful in getting assistance early on and putting together their supporting document and putting together a strong reentry plan are going to be will be more likely to be considered by the courts for resentencing, but also be more successful in getting their sense reduced or released. Um, as required by legislation, we worked with the nine county DAs to identify a measure of recidivism. And the overwhelming consensus has been that uh, convictions should be the measure by, reported by type. Ideally, what you would want to do is to report the three-year conviction rates to measure the effectiveness 
of prosecutor initiated resentencing here in California. But keep in mind that this is a three-year pilot that ends in September of 2024, and the evaluation only ends six months after that. So what it means is that we'll probably be limited to only measuring at best one-year conviction rates. And so extending the evaluation for an additional two or three years would be important to allow us to, um, to collect sufficient data to really measure um, those three-year conviction rates. Lastly, I just wanted to point out this pilot's occurring in the context of other resentencing effort, reform efforts in California, which you're well aware of. The two most important that I wanted to highlight were those, um, the increased resentencing efforts by CDCR and by the DAs. They each have different um, criteria for um, case selection. And, and in some instances it overlaps, in other instances um, we have cases where the DA has decided not to put forth an individual for resentencing, but CCR did. Um, currently, at, in, month, in the 18 months we are now into the project, the DAs are, are dealing with about 187 CDCR initiated uh, resentencing cases, so there's clear overlap. But we just wanted to make the point that our evaluation really focuses on the, the pilot program per se, but if you really want to understand the impact of resentencing in California, you really should include the efforts that's going on by both the DAs and the CDCR. So again, we're in year two of the evaluation. We're collecting case level data and cost data. We're doing the implementation interviews and we will have our year two report to the legislature, which will have a lot more data um, um, that is due October 1st, 2023. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and I'm happy to um, answer any questions you might have. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Davis. Can you bring us back to slide number nine? Sure, um, just a minute. Um, so, <clears throat> can you, is, is yes. that still being shared? Okay. That's, that's, yes, and that's the one I'm looking at. I just wanna make sure I'm reading this right. I believe I am. I First, I wanna make sure that everybody, I know that this is just the first mix six months of the pilot project, so it's just the beginning. But if I'm reading this right, only eight cases out of all the counties that you were studying uh, made it to court in the first place? Yes, and keep in mind two things. This pilot program started in September of 2021. In a number of cases in the counties, they did not receive their funding until November, early December, uh, so two or three months late. So they were still standing up their programs um, in the early part of 2022. So this really, this goes from September 2021 to March 2022, but that's partly the problem that we're seeing here. But at least a review out of 260 cases or so, only eight made it through. And of those eight, only three actually were sort by the court. So right. less than half. Um, so I guess I was curious if you had thoughts on um, either expediting or, we wanna increase both of those numbers, right? More cases should yeah. go before the courts, and the courts, once they get them, should review the, review them more quickly. I was wondering if you have thoughts on how to address either of those areas. The the thing that um, that I wanted to mention is is a couple of things for the counties. On so one is um, it took time for them to staff up their uh, resentencing units and establish those units. And partly is is the problem is that all of the counties are dealing with the sorry I <laughs> have. If I don't move, my light turns off. Um, all of the counties are dealing with um, COVID-related staffing shortages. So that has actually has also impacted the county's ability to um, stand up these units, assign staff, et cetera. But the other thing is that um, it's a situation where you now have the courts coming into play. And the courts also have been dealing with COVID-related um, staffing shortages and and overloads, and so, and so it's it's also been the case where um, it's it has varied from county to county their ability to work with the courts to get them to assign a specific court to hear these cases or to prioritize these cases, and so um, that is one of the things that's going on here. The other thing about the DA decision pending is that there's a lot of information that has to be collected, so. Um, so it's not just, um, for example, getting the CCR C files, but it's also getting information from the individual about what they is making their case about why they should be considered 
them providing letters of support, supporting documents, them developing a reentry plan. If you're if you've been incarcerated 30 years, it's very difficult for you to kind of imagine what would be a, a reasonable reentry plan. So so there's a lot of um, gathering of information that has to occur there and putting those um, packet information together in order to, that for the DA to feel that it is strong enough case to be, be able to present it to the court. Got it. Um, Assembly member Brian. Curious, you had mentioned that every county got the same bucket of money regardless of their size, right? And I'm I'm wondering, do we know the geographic data of the ones that were, the eight that were referred to court, did they come all from the same county? Um, or do we know if any particular county is is the bulk of, you know, the 163 pending or the 259 review? Let me uh, clarify that. So the, the when I referred to they all got the same amount of money, I referred only to the amount of money they got for hiring, contracting with community-based organizations. Gotcha. The amount of money that they got for the resentencing pilot program varied by the county size. So gotcha. the larger the counties, they got um, over a million dollars to the DA. Um, in general, the, the DA got more, the public defender got about two thirds of whatever the DA got. And so it varies um, depending on the size of the county, how much funding they actually got to implement this. Um, so, so I just wanted to clarify that point. Gotcha. All right. Um, are there other questions? You know, I had a question on the far right uh, column, resentenced and still incarcerated. Was there any kind of reduction? Uh, but there's still a, some of the sentence to be served? That's yes. Fairly, that's yes. fairly common. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, this is, this is helpful. Um, Again, let me just try to summarize a couple of the pieces of, um, if you could stop sharing, that'd be helpful. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I do want to move on to our next panel. First of all, thank you very much, Dr. Davis. But this is just another illustration of one of the laws that we've been, that we were responsible for promoting or suggesting. And I think that the results have been um, room for, I think we put this into the room for improvement uh, category, right, where there's been relatively uh, fewer cases than perhaps we would have hoped for uh, throughout the system. Earlier today, we heard about the nickel priors and the data that we heard about the nickel priors seems to be going um, at least as well as it could have been hoped, especially because that was just a merely a discretionary uh, result. The, the gun enhancements, maybe not, um, as much progress as we'd hoped and some mixed data that we're still trying to unpack. And then we heard about the Racial Justice Act and the problems and the quagmires and trying to um, implement that. So anyway, just trying to reset our conversation for today. So thank you again, Dr. Davis. I wanna move on to our next panel um, who are prosecutors who can address this issue um, and others. Um, each member of our panel of prosecutors who are coming up um, will address different reforms that we've discussed this afternoon with special focus on uh, sentencing discretion, changes to the gang enhancement, which we haven't quite touched on yet, and prosecutorial led uh, uh, resentencings, which we were just talking about. So um, our panelists are Robert Messman, Senior Assistant District Attorney from Orange County. Hello. Um, Brian Slater, Supervising Deputy, Deputy District Attorney from the gang team in Santa Clara County. Hello and Diane Turan, who's the Director of Prosecutorial Prosecution Support Operations for the LA District Attorney. Thank you all uh, for joining us. Um, Mr. Messman, would you take us away? Uh, sure. Um, I'm gonna talk about some uh, kind of big picture perspectives from prosecutors, but before I do, I just wanna uh, highlight what I, what I view as perhaps a misconception. I know uh, a lot of discussion today was on enhancements, and I know through the last couple of years has been a large focus on enhancements and eliminated enhancements. And I know, for example, the, the first speaker from the California Policy Lab talked about, you know, the nickel priors are being um, uh, dismissed more than the gun enhancement. Uh, in my opinion, I don't have like empirical data, but probably that could be because uh, with the nickel priors, that's a recidivism um, uh, kind of status enhancement. Um, there's no washout, those could be very old. There's other uh, sentencing enhancements or alternative sentences like three strikes that are incorporated into that. That could be why those are being dismissed at a higher rate versus a firearms enhancement. 
is specifically tied to the conduct, usually more serious conduct. Uh, 12 or 22.53 enhancements are limited just to the most serious uh, offenses. So that could be part of uh, the discrepancy why we see one type of enhancement uh, being dismissed more than others. But with regard to conduct enhancements, you can't eliminate conduct enhancements without looking at the entire California Penal Code and California criminal justice scheme. Enhancements are a key part of California criminal jurisprudence. For example, there's no such crime as armed robbery, right? There's, it's robbery. What makes it an armed robbery is a weapon enhancement, a firearm enhancement. If you wanna get rid of enhancements like those conduct enhancements, you need to then go and look at a robbery and create different types of robbery. Uh, there's no such crime as assault causing great bodily injury. There's just an assault. Um, the, what makes a great bodily injury is the enhancement. So I think it's important to note, if you're looking at getting rid of enhancements, you can't do that in a vacuum. You need to look at the larger sentencing scheme. And I've heard some people say, well, just charge a robbery and then charge uh, assault with a firearm. Well, that doesn't work either because you have legal prohibitions on punishing or sentencing on more than one offense, specifically Penal Code Section 654. So a strong arm robbery is different than a robbery with the use of a gun or someone gets shot, seriously injured or killed. Those are not the same crime. Without an enhancement, those crimes are treated equally. So I just wanted to point out that misconception. Um, in general, I think prosecutors have a concern with lack of finality. And I know Judge Lowenthal uh, touched on that. The California Constitution says victims of crimes are entitled to finality in their criminal cases. That's embedded in the California Constitution. And I think all these, you know, since 2011, we've counted over 75 criminal justice reform measures. Most of them are going back, look back, resentencing, and is unwinding criminal convictions. Criminal convictions that have been long since final, adjudicated, affirmed on appeal, uh, affirmed in the federal courts through habeas processes. So that's a major concern uh, of prosecutors in general is the lack of finality. And I know Judge Lowenthal talked about finality of judgment versus sentence finality, but legally judgment includes sentence. A judgment is not final until sentence has been pronounced. And one of the bills Judge Lowenthal um, was promoting is AB 600, which would expand the resentencing under 1172.1, former 1170D, um, that would actually allow judges unilaterally to change the charge to a lesser included or lesser related offense. That goes well beyond just resentencing. That's changing the actual conviction and the conduct that the person engaged in. Um, another concern prosecutors have is these are unfunded mandates. In my office, I supervise an entirely new unit that was created with more than 10 attorneys called the Post-Conviction and Special Litigation Unit. We have to staff all of these post-conviction motions. The courts have to deal with it. The public defenders have to deal with it. But we haven't gotten any funding. There's funding specifically for the defense bar and public defenders, but there's not um, similar funding specifically for prosecutors that have to respond. It's a lot of work to look into these, respond. Some of them have merit and we may agree with but it's a lot of resources to, to deal with this. And that's on top of our kind of day jobs, which is the day-to-day -day work that prosecutors have done for decades, which is review cases that come in, um, uh, file cases, prosecute cases, go to sentencing cases. There's tons of work and uh, we're really feeling the budgetary pressure and the manpower pressure as other people have pointed out. We're understaffed, we have been, some of it's COVID related, um, but you know we are feeling pressures uh, to respond and do a good job dealing with all these uh, new laws. Um, finally, I'd just like to point out, there does seem to be a lot of contradictions in the implementation of these laws. Um, a lot of these laws talk about judicial increase in judicial discretion, but at the same time, they limit ju judicial discretion. SB 567, Bradford, dealing with uh, determinate sentencing presumptions. I'm not sure why that bill was enacted. There was no legal requirement for that. Uh, didn't implicate Apprendi or Cunningham, um, but that's tying judges' hands. The judge is in the best position to determine the appropriate sentence given the facts of the case and the particulars of the offender. That bill ties the judge's hands. Um, the resentencing's under 1170D, or former 1170D, 
why is there a presumption in favor of resentencing? If anything, there should be a presumption in favor of the original sentence that's been final, affirmed on appeal, um, and hasn't been disturbed. Why are is kind of the scales of justice being tilted in favor of resentencing? And then when you uh, give the judge discretion uh, to determine if there if it's if the offender would be an unreasonable risk to danger to public safety, it's narrowly defined under Penal Code Section 1170.18 as committing a super strike which is a very limited subset of offenses. So a judge can determine, I believe it's very likely beyond a reasonable doubt that you're gonna go commit robberies, mayhem, gang shootings, assaults, domestic violence. But under the law, I still have to release you because I cannot prove beyond a reasonable doubt or with clear and convincing evidence that you're gonna commit a super strike. It just seems um, uh, contradictory on the one hand to give judges discretion to resentence, and on the other hand, put on all these presumptions and limits on what a judge can consider. Uh, I'm happy to, I have a lot more to talk about. I know I'm limited to five minutes and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. I would note that uh, I did start the Conviction Integrity Unit at our office in Orange County. So, you know, I'm not some uh, stereotypical hard-nosed prosecutor that just wants to put everyone away. Uh, I see both sides of it and, um, you know, I view part of my job as, you know, not only convicting people and prosecuting people, but also making sure people are treated fairly and making sure, very importantly, that we don't have wrongful convictions and innocent people uh, are not serving time in prison. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Slater? Yes, well, um, thank you. And I wanted to thank the committee for inviting me to be here and to take part in this important discussion. Um, my focus, because I'm on the gang team, was going to be about uh, gang crime specifically. Um, so I, I do want to thank you for um, inviting me to participate in the discussion about um, specifically gang crimes um, and how we sort of find the balance between um, the need to ensure that uh, violent gang crimes are um, effectively prosecuted um, and find that balance between effective prosecution to ensure public safety, but also ensure that our laws are applied fairly without regard to race and in a way that doesn't unnecessarily stigmatize uh, lower level nonviolent offenders, uh, making their rehabilitation actually less likely and being counterproductive um, as far as public safety is concerned. So in Santa Clara County, as we work to find this balance, um, we are mindful that gang crimes disproportionately affect communities of color. Uh, last year in our county, about 86% of victims in gang cases were people of color. 78% of those victims were Hispanic. So law enforcement must respond just as vigorously to violent crimes in minority neighborhoods and communities as we do to violent crimes committed in predominantly white neighborhoods. Um, at the same time, we should not needlessly charge lower level nonviolent uh, offenses as gang offenses, as gang crimes. Um, to that end, in our office, we do not charge gang enhancements on misdemeanor cases absent extraordinary public safety concerns. Um, and in fact, we have not charged gang enhancements on any misdemeanor case um, since our district attorney announced that policy in 2020. We also generally reserve uh, gang charges and enhancements for serious or violent felonies. Last year, only 6% of the cases that we charged as gang cases involved serious, uh, a non-serious or non-violent felonies. So over 90% of the cases that we are charging as gang cases are serious or violent felonies. So we do agree that gang laws should be used sparingly Prosecutors should use them as uh, precisely targeted lasers, not as hatchets. And AB 333 was an effort uh, to mandate that all prosecutors use gang law sparingly. Um, but I also, my experience has been that there have been unintended consequences of those, uh, the change to our gang law. One um, concern expressed by this committee uh, was that white gangs are prosecuted less frequently than gangs composed primarily of people of color. And that is true. 
but by enacting more stringent predicate requirements, AB 333 actually makes it harder for us to prosecute gangs that are rarely prosecuted. So it is easy uh, to find qualifying predicates for gangs that we routinely prosecute. For instance, in my office, we uh, prosecute Norteño gangs all the time. We can always meet the predicate requirement when we are prosecuting a Norteño gang but it is difficult and sometimes even impossible to find qualifying predicates for less frequently charged groups. Um, so the result is that even if we wanted to charge a gang crime against a less frequently prosecuted, a white gang, an Aryan gang, we often would not be able to do that. And the changes made by AB 333 actually exacerbates that problem. In other words, it's just, we, we are more able to meet the burden um, when we're prosecuting a group that we have prosecuted be previously, if it's a less frequently prosecuted group, we're less likely to be able to meet that burden. So I think this goes against the intention um, of this committee um, in those, making those changes. Another uh, consequence is that we must now prove that each predicate offense provided a common benefit to the gang. To do this, we now may need to subpoena a victim from a prior case to come testify at the trial of the new case where we're using the predicate and ask that victim to come to court and testify about a case that has nothing to do with them anymore. They're no longer the victim, but we're needing them to come to court to testify uh, to prove out that prior. Uh, another uh, consequence is that the more stringent requirements of AB 333 and bifurcation require significantly longer preliminary hearings and jury trials, worsening delays in the criminal justice system. That's bad for victims, defendants, and society, and just further burdens our already overly burdened court system. Another consequence is that defendants can be charged, well, as you know, defendants can be charged with multiple discrete crimes. Um, committed on different occasions if they are somehow related to each other or are of the same class of crimes. For instance, um, a series of home invasion robberies. Um, so you have robberies committed on uh, different days by the same group of gang members. Um, they can all be charged in the same case. Uh, we have judges, at least in our county, who have interpreted AB 333 to mean that you cannot use um, any offense charged in your current case as a predicate, even if they occurred on different dates. So for instance, in our robbery series, you have a robbery on in January, February, March, and April. Uh, we have judges saying, you cannot use this robbery committed in January as a predicate for your offenses in February, March, and April. Um, so that I think has two un unintended consequences. First, it can encourage prosecutors to actually engage in less efficient issuing practices because we can get around this simply by charging each robbery separately um, under a different docket. Um, and then we have separate preliminary hearings and separate trials, so it makes the system less efficient. The other is it makes it more difficult to prove gang enhancements, again, against less frequently charged gangs, such as white Aryan gangs, as I mentioned before. I, I, I want to, I don't, I'm sorry to cut you off. I want to get back to that during the question and answer period, but I, you've gone over, your is there anything else you wanted no. to hit? No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Okay. But you did raise some interesting points I do want to circle back to. Uh, Ms. Turan, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Um, I think uh, what I was called to uh, talk about is the resentencing program in LA County. Uh, we, are, we are part of the pilot program um, and we received over $2 million, but we're having similar issues that Orange County is having in that uh, we have staffing shortages. We need to, you know, our, our day job, so to speak, is staffing our courts, prosecuting crimes. So we don't have the resources that we would have liked to um, commit to 
reviewing cases uh, for possible resentencing uh, that we had hoped. Having said that, uh, what we did is uh, even before we received the money, we started in April of uh, 2021, uh, created a unit uh, with a handful of individuals uh, that's been depleted over time due to staffing issues. Uh, but at that point, we started reviewing cases involving individuals over 50 who had been in for more than 10 years, uh, had committed non-serious, non-violent non offenses, uh, were not sex registrants, uh, et cetera, as well as those cases of uh, individuals who were 14 or 15 years old when they committed their crimes and were tried as adults and could not legally be tried as adults today. So um, our resentencing unit started uh, looking at those. It took quite a while to get off the ground um, it, for all the reasons that the doctor mentioned. Um, but uh, one big reason in LA County that it's so difficult is because we are so big. So we are basically having to run around all over the county, figure out where to file uh, these petitions uh, and make multiple court appearances. Um, so that's been something that has been problematic. We do work uh, with the public defender's office. However, we're the ones that decide what cases we want to look at and obviously whether or not we want to file petitions. Uh, since uh, April of 2021 to the present, um, we have uh, resentenced, I believe, 55 uh, DA-initiated uh, individuals. Um, uh, and starting in December of 2022, I'm sorry, 2021, the resentencing unit also took over handling all of the CDCR initiated uh, resentencing cases, uh, again, to, you know, try to handle them as consistently as possible. Uh, and we have to date resentenced uh, 64 CDCR initiated um, uh, uh, petitions uh, or petitioners. Uh, of those, 96 individuals ended up being released. Um, so they were resentenced to time served offers. And the other 23 were um, individuals who had their sentences reduced, um, uh, sometimes from you know 150 years to life to 25 years to life. So they would still need to go before the parole board before being reduced, but nonetheless, um, they their sentences were reduced significantly. Um, of the individuals we resentenced, 112 of them have been men and uh, seven uh, women, 50%. African American, 33% Hispanic, 11% white, and 6% other. Um, in addition to the DA and CDCR cases that we've resentenced, uh, uh, we have also independently and separately, uh, not out of our unit, but uh, with uh, different individuals, resentenced 24 individuals who were previously sentenced to uh, the death penalty. We've resentence them to life without the possibility of parole. Um, I mean, that's basically, um, uh, you know, what we're doing in LA. Uh, as far as uh, recommendations, I just want to join in uh, Judge Lowenthal's recommendations. We would very much welcome um, judges having the discretion to initiate these petitions on their own, and we would very much welcome having a centralized court. I think if we had one, we would be um, much more efficient in the work that we're doing. And that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, you each addressed different areas, and I, I hope to touch on different ones. This might be, we might jump a little bit all over the place. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm going to start with you, Mr. Rand, a, a couple of questions. Uh, first, <clears throat> logistically, I know that it can be difficult to collect information, data, um, prison documents. Is there something uh, legislatively that you might suggest that we as a committee recommend? 
um, in order to help facilitate that process so you can make your evaluation quicker. It seemed that the evaluation process seemed to be a quite a big sticking area. And I know, and you and I have talked in the past about how hard these documents can be getting or CDCR doing a decent job at this point. I mean, to be honest, I think CDCR is doing a, a pretty decent job uh, getting the records for us uh, and giving us summary data from which we can look through it and try to prioritize individuals. Um, but uh, prosecutors uh, are, you know, throughout the state, very reluctant to uh, recommend resentencing based solely on summary data. They do want to see the central files. They want to go through each and every page of the central file, all the rules violations. Uh, recently, an issue has been anytime there's a confidential, any reference to a confidential memo and how we can get that and what that confidential might memo might contain with respect to gang affiliation, because certainly that's relevant to recidivism. Um, I, I will tell you that of the individuals, of the DA initiated individuals, um, and not the death penalty ones, obviously they're not getting out, but of the individuals that have been released um, so far, our recidivism rate, if you count it as any any kind of felony conviction, it's zero. Um, however, we did have one person arrested on uh, uh, a non-serious felony, uh, but then bench warranted. So, uh, but I, I do want to just clarify for a second. So, mm -hmm. I'm so CDC. I see. I hear the CDC is getting doing a good job with the data, and I will just give a shout out to that team. They've mm -hmm. been very good in my experience as well. Mm -hmm. Is it this? Is it? Diff, are you still having difficulties getting the C files, or is that process going fairly well? As, smoothly as well. I think the process is going fairly well from my perspective, as long as we have a waiver from the um, the individual, then uh, the turnaround time of getting uh, the bulk of that information is pretty quickly, uh, is pretty quick. Where we're running into problems is if the defense attorney gets it, they don't necessarily immediately turn it over. They, they want there, us to view it in context with other information. So sometimes they might sit on it for a while. So the complaints I get from our prosecutors are that the defense attorney doesn't get them the information quick enough, and that's why they're not turning the cases around. And I, I'm, I'm going to move over to the other DAs in a second. Is there a reason why that we need a waiver from the inmate? I mean, other, otherwise, we would have to subpoena the records. But I'm saying if there was a new statute, that's what you know. This committee oh. is in the business of is in making recommendations. And would it expedite the process? And do you see a problem with DAs being able to request? C files, including confidential, so as members of law enforcement to help expedite this process. Actually, I would love that. We would love that. We would love to not have to wait for defense counsel to get a waiver and them, them sort of receive the information and then give it to us. It also increases the integrity of the information. So there's no suspicion yeah. that they could have deleted something from the C files. So that would be much better. We. The, on individuals that aren't represented, we have them sign a waiver and then we have the C file sent directly to us. But if no, they- You don't need yeah. to convince me that there's a, okay. that's a, that's a problem. <laughs> okay. um, as was Mr. Slater and or Mr. Messman, in terms of, and we're just talking for the time being about the DA initiated resentencing, I was wondering if you have any insight and I realize that that was not the center of what you were speaking to this process, how there might be ways to expedite it or improve it procedurally. Do either of you have any insight on that? Um. I don't really, because our office has a policy that we do not um, undertake DA-initiated resentencings. Our position is that CDCR is in the best position to determine whether the person has exhibited good conduct and rehabilitated themselves and would be a good candidate for release. So, so regardless, yeah. regardless that there is law that says that you can do this, you're saying you won't? Correct. We have an office policy that we, we rely on CDCR-initiated uh, um, resentencings and we 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 respond to those and staff those but we don't undertake our own we have a conviction integrity unit that reviews cases for um uh, factual innocence and unlawful convictions uh, but we do not undertake da initiated resentencings under 1172.1 got it mr slater do you have any insight here um it's, it's not the area that i sort of am assigned to but i do know my office will initiate resentencings um we have done that now Generally, that is on the recommendation of a defense attorney who will reach out to us and say, I think my client has done really well or one of the community based organizations and sort of propose that we look at it um, in a 
sort of related area, 1437 litigation, when we get those motions, there will sometimes be a discussion with defense counsel bringing those motions where we will say, we may not be opposing this if you can show us that your client has done well in prison. Um, and we ask defense counsel to get us the C file. Um, and I have spoken to defense attorneys where there have been problems with getting that, um, where there is delays in getting those records. Um, and also ex experienced uh, the same thing that LA County has experienced where there are redacted confidential memos that we really need to be able to see in order to evaluate has this person done well in prison and do we want to therefore reach a resolution with defense counsel on 1437, you know, recognizing they're gonna get out sooner, um, sort of, and not oppose it because they've done well in prison. Senator Skinner, thank you. Go ahead, Senator Skinner. You're I have a mute. couple of questions and obviously one on this subject, but I, if you are still asking questions, I can wait. No, go. Okay, so um, I want to ask uh, first our um, Mr. Messman. Uh, you referenced um, a difficulty that if you didn't have enhancements, you couldn't do a proper, uh, say, a robbery charge. Um, but as far as I have been able to ascertain from looking at the penal code and the changes, uh, many of these enhancements, including most of the gun ones, didn't occur until the 80s. And obviously, guns have been around for far longer than that. And obviously, robberies with guns have been around far longer than that. So I really have a hard time understanding why we feel we, can, we only can address a crime with enhancements. Well, I, didn't, I, I didn't say that. And, uh, well, you did say that you well, could the, properly charge. Right. Well, I can't go back to the 1980s. That, that's before my time. Um, but I can tell you that violent crime is up. Uh, crimes involving firearms is up. I mean, I'm asking a question about the ability to charge appropriately without an enhancement. Well, as I said before, not all robberies are the same. You could have a lower, relatively lower level strong arm robbery, and you could have another armed robbery with a gun where a gun is discharged, someone's pistol whipped, someone's actually shot. Um, under the law, those are all violations of Penal Code Section 211 robbery. There's no, there's no crime of armed robbery. So the only way to differentiate, and obviously the person who uses the gun to pistol whip, to shoot somebody, to stab someone with a knife, is more culpable than the person who's not using a weapon or doesn't injure somebody. So under current law, the only, the only way to differentiate those crimes is through conduct enhancement, which are directly tied to the conduct that the, in, the defendant engages in. If the defendant engages in conduct involving a weapon, involving injury, involving use of a firearm or discharge of a firearm, you have the conduct enhancement that corresponds to that. Uh, otherwise, all robberies are treated the same, regardless well, of the severity. If I, if I may, it's, I mean, isn't, there still is some double counting and I think that that's what's some concern. So for example, in the triad, right? Like isn't the upper level of the triad supposed to capture the more aggravated, I'm trying to avoid the word firearm, but more aggravated crime, more aggravated robbery versus going to the upper term and adding on an enhancement on top of that. Doesn't that seem like double counting? Well, yeah, there are prohibitions on dual use. So there are, there are some prohibitions on dual using uh, aggravation, factors and aggravations to get consecutive sentences, to get the upper term, and then also to impose the enhancement. So there are legal prohibitions on kind of double dipping uh, in certain situations. But uh, again, the, 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 the triad, for example, robbery is a two, three, five. Uh, the courts have rules of court where you look at characteristics of the offender and characteristics of the crime, but those involve a wide variety of issues more than just uh, use of a weapon. Clearly the person who brings a gun to a robbery is that's a more serious crime than someone who doesn't bring a gun to a robbery. Someone who uses a gun in a robbery that's more serious than someone who doesn't. And that's where the enhancement um, relates to. And, and again, there is some sentencing discretion with regard to the triad, but that involves a lot of other factors more than just use of a weapon um, or committing injury, though those are factors to be considered. So 
um, I, I won't, uh, I, I was interested in whether the other um, DAs felt similarly since we obviously know from the previous slides that enhancements are not used um, uniformly in every county. And yet I would imagine if we go deeper into the data, many of the crimes were similar, but their enhancements were not used. And clearly we also know from the data that we are presented today that enhancements are used more frequently on uh, uh, dependents of color. And um, so there just seems to be some real discrepancies in application. And, but the question I wanna now ask is about uh, SB 1437. So first to Mr. Um, Messman, your um, office takes, considers petitions that are submitted by uh, a defense counsel for a 1437, uh, a resentencing under 1437? Yes, of course. We have a, a whole post-conviction litigation unit that I would say the majority of their time is spent on 1437s. Okay. Only reason I asked is because you sort of referenced that only resentencing was that from CDCR and clearly under 1437, the, uh, a defense counsel can- Correct, yeah, I was, uh, Senator, I was referring just to the former 1170D, the 1172.1 okay. resentencings. And if I could just add one point, I, I agree with your concerns about kind of the disparity by county by county in how enhancements are imposed. Um, and, you know, ironically, one of the reasons why the gun use enhancements used to be mandatory was a concern that everybody should be treated equally, like 10, uh, 10, 20 life, use a gun, go to prison, regardless if you were in North, Northern California, Southern California, urban, rural, regardless of the color of your skin, whether you had a public defender or a high priced defense attorney, if you used a gun, that enhancement was being imposed. Now with the discretion to strike enhancements, and I understand why that was recommended, but you do have disparity now, uh, county by county. Um, you know, a high-priced defense attorney with an affluent defendant can come in and, and get the enhancement dismissed. And maybe an indigent defendant, a person of color that doesn't have those resources, can't get the enhancement dismissed. So you I are think seeing the data, an increase in equity. Yeah, the data we've reviewed shows that the disparities were even greater before discretion. And as you know, there wasn't discretion until most recently. But let me ask uh, Mr. Slater, you referenced that, um, that you all are looking at conduct in prison in relationship to 1437 petitions. I'm, I mean, obviously, if a per, under 1437, it's a clear issue of were you, because we changed the law, is the crime that you committed now felony murder or not? And the issue of whether someone should be resentenced based on their conduct, that is not an issue in terms of how 1437 was constructed. It is whether the underlying crime was the, that crime. So I'm a little bit uh, concerned, especially about confidential memos. It, you seem to express that unless you had these confidential memos that you wouldn't be able to make such an assessment. And uh, we've had much testimony before the committee in that because our, um, unlike, unlike our judicial process where there has to be corroboration around any uh, witness uh, testimony um, or there does not have to be in terms of uh, memos in a CDC or in a, um, a inmate's file regarding their conduct. They may have no, con no idea themselves that they were written up for a certain type of misconduct. They may have no idea that someone uh, reported that they had such conduct and uh, they may not go through any process for. So the fact that one would feel that they needed to rely on such confidential memos that we know require no corroboration when the underlying statute basically says that you know, either the crime met these conditions or it did not. So I'd appreciate if you give a little more explanation. Sure, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, so I, I, I'm talking about a situation where both sides, the prosecution and the defense have colorable, legitimate arguments to make that 1437 um, either entitles this person to release, to relief or does not. So uh, just like any case, 
we often engage in negotiated uh, dispositions on a homicide where um, the defense points out weaknesses in our cases. We may negotiate that down to a second degree murder or a voluntary manslaughter. We often take the same approach to a 1437 where the defense has a colorable argument and they may prevail. Uh, we, on the other hand, also have a colorable argument and we may prevail if we go to a full hearing on this matter. Um, and we will engage in negotiations with defense counsel and things we consider are how violent was that underlying conduct? What was this person's involvement? How old were they? Um, you know, were they 18 or were they 25? Um, how much more time do they have to serve? Uh, so basically we're making an evaluation of does it make sense to reach a resolution with defense counsel? Are we going to concede this motion? Um, are, is defense counsel going to withdraw the motion for an agreement of resentencing? Um, are we going to agree, stipulate? This is how actually most of these cases have resolved in our county um, is a stipulation between the prosecution and the defense as to how this crime should be reclassified. So. Uh, in a gang case, um, say a, a gang a group beating where someone dies, uh, we may agree that this person, their crime should be reclassified to a 245 uh, for a set amount of time. Before we reach that resolution, we're gonna consider how well they've done in prison. Um, often that's at the invitation to defense counsel, they'll say, you know, my client is in fire camp now, they're doing really well, uh, let me, present you this information. And then when we are convinced that they are in fact doing well, we're more inclined to resolve that case for the 245 rather than litigating and trying to preserve the homicide conviction. Um, I, I do agree with you. There are problems with confidential memos where we're aware of that. All I'm saying is we want to have as much information as we can um, in making this evaluation. Um, are we gonna base um, our opinion that we should oppose the release, uh, relief based on one confidential memo, no, but we just want to have a full set of information and data when we're making this evaluation. Does anybody else on the panel have a question? Or Senator Skinner, just one last question. All right, uh, unfortunately we have to move on. There's a lot of issues that we've touched on that I really want to do follow up on. And, you know, as I say to others, no good deed goes unpunished. So I do appreciate your time and we'll follow up with you. Um, particularly, uh, Ms. Turan, if there are things that we can help to do to expedite the review process, you think procedurally any statutes the legislature might be able to do, for example, with the C files. And Mr. Slater, I did want to follow up with you and maybe we will about whether the unintended consequences of AB 333, particularly if we're exacerbating the racial disparity issue, if you guys have data on that or specific ways that we might be able to address and correct that, obviously an unintended problem. So um, with that said, I apologize for, for rushing us on, but we, but we do have a lot to get through. I appreciate all of your time, we all do, and um, we will certainly be in touch. So thank you very much. Thank you. Resolve that problem. And it's something that perhaps if you could send it to staff, we could, we could look at. So I appreciate that. Yes, I will send a letter with that. Thank you. Thank you. I think that that's it for public comment. That's it. Wow. All right. This has been the end of another long and I think really productive and helpful uh, hearing. Thank you to my fellow committee members. Thank you especially to staff who gathered all our witnesses, prepared the memos, really got us up to speed. Thank you to all our witnesses. And um, I wish everybody a happy weekend. This is the beginning of our uh, hearing schedule for the year. We'll have several others and we'll continue to address these issues um, in the months to come. If you have comments, please send them in because we're going to continue chewing these over until uh, really December, November, December. So thank you all again. Have a good weekend and um, I'll see you all soon. Thank you, Mr. Chair.